Good afternoon. Another exciting edition of reading with Mr. Ebley. So we're going to continue on with the grenade. Uh, and, uh, just the fan just blew my page. So we're going to continue on with grenade. Uh, this chapter is about Hideki and it's called Banzai. So here we go. Hideki and the other boys crept toward the delicious smell, and sure enough, there they were, American soldiers. There were almost 20 of them, sitting around a cook fire or in holes they had dug in the ground. Some of them wrote letters or cleaned their guns. Others were eating a pig they'd cooked up. Hideki could hear their voices on the breeze, the long, slow, deep, slurred sounds of English that made no sense to him. None of the soldiers had seen or heard them yet, which meant the Blood and Iron Student Corps had the element of surprise. This really was Hideki's moment of glory, but he wasn't feeling so bold anymore. This was going to be a violent battle. This might be the moment he died. One of the other boys, Takeshi, must have been thinking the same thing too. Hideki could see him sobbing quietly a few meters away. Shigatomo's Maboy tugged at Hideki's gut, and Hideki took a step back. Here's what we'll do, Yoshio whispered at Hideki's side, making him jump. We'll crawl closer, and then when we're all in range, I'll whistle and... Kadoom! A grenade exploded close enough to knock them over, and Hideki's ears rang from the explosion. What? What happened? He asked as he pulled himself back up on his knees. Takeshi killed himself. He blew himself up with his own grenade, one of the boys yelled in horror. Was it an accident, or had Takeshi killed himself out of fear? Hideki was still gaping, still trying to understand, when he heard the American soldiers cry out in alarm. The element of surprise was gone. The Americans were going for their guns. They would be on top of Hideki and the others in seconds. Attack, attack, Yoshio cried. He pulled the pin on his own grenade, whacked the brass igniter on a rock, and hurled the grenade. It went off with a poom a few meters away. Hideki couldn't see what Yoshio had hit, because a second later, the bullets started flying. Pack, 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 chum, chum, chum. That's my sound effects. Hideki barely had room to curl up and hide behind a shredded tree stump. He watched as a fifth year named Jensi couldn't get to cover in time. Jensi was hit again and again by bullets his body dancing like a broken puppet before he crumpled to the ground. Hideki had never seen somebody die before. His own body shook uncontrollably, like he was the one being hit, and tears sprang to his eyes. Banzai! Some of the boys cried, and Hideki heard one or two more grenades explode. The American bullets became a deadly hailstorm, and Hideki clenched himself into a tight, shaking ball. He looked at the grenade he held in his hand. He knew he should be brave. He knew he should stand up and throw his grenade and kill as many Americans as he could the way Lieutenant Colonel Sano had told him to, but he couldn't do it. His fear froze him. He couldn't move. Off to his right, his friend Katsumasa stood, grenade in hand. Long live the Emperor, he cried. Katsumasa threw his grenade with all his strength. The grenade hit a tree, bounced right back at Kats Katsumama, and exploded in his face with a boom. The blast knocked Hideki from his hiding place, and he landed on his back with a thump that knocked the wind from him. He gasped for air and swallowed a scream. This was a disaster. It wasn't supposed to go like this. This wasn't what it had been like in training. It was all happening so fast, and they had no control over any of it. Hideki was going to die here. They were all going to die. His eyes darted around, looking for somewhere to hide, but all he saw was the decimated hillside. Less than half a dozen boys were still alive and fighting. The rest had been shot or blown apart. If he didn't get out of here, Hideki was going to join them. The next chapter is about Ray. And it's called First Watch. Ray leaned on his entrenching tool and stretched his sore back. He'd spent the last half hour digging a four-foot deep foxhole with Big John that both of them would sleep in that night. If he'd thought shoveling hay back home was hard, it was nothing compared to shoveling sand and coral on Okinawa. Was this what it was like for my father in the First World War? Ray thought. That war had, all, had been all trenches and foxholes. Were his father's arms and back sore every night from digging endless ditches? When the hole was finished, Ray wanted nothing more than to pass out in it and sleep until next week, but no such luck. Barbecue, the sergeant called. You've got guard duty, first watch, and be careful. While you two were off clearing caves, we were attacked by a bunch of kids with grenades. Ray had heard the sound of shots and explosions in the distance as they'd been returning from the cave. He shook his head. Women and children throwing themselves off a cliff? Children with grenades? This definitely wasn't what he signed up for. Big John clapped Ray on the shoulder. The fun never stops when you're a Marine. Don't worry. I'll stay up with you for a bit. Ray sighed and picked up his rifle. Don't forget this, Big John said, plunking Ray's helmet on his head. That helmet's the best thing the Marine Corps ever gave you. Barbecue. It's got a hundred uses. Really? 
Sure, Big John said. You can wash in it, shave in it, cook coffee in it, barf in it when you get sick. You can put gas in it to clean your gun, dig a hole with it if you lose your trenching tool, sit on it and use it to bail out your foxhole when it rains. That right there is the greatest military tool ever invented. Ray reached up to straighten his helmet. You forgot the part about keeping it you from getting shot in the head, he told Big John. Big John snorted. Oh, it don't do that. Ray remembered the sniper putting a bullet right through Sergeant Meredith's helmet. That made him think of hard luck again. The look on his face after the bullet hit him, the way he tumbled headfirst into the mud, laughing and joking one minute, dead the next. The camp settled into quiet as darkness fell. One man in each foxhole went to sleep while the others, like Ray, watched the surrounding terrain for intruders. But all Ray saw was hard luck, over and over again. How'd you end up in the Marines, Barbecue? Big John whispered. Huh? Ray said, shaking off the memory of hard luck's death. Had Big John caught him doing the thousand yard stare and asked him a question to distract him? Didn't matter. It worked. Oh, I, uh, I graduated from high school and I wasn't going to college, so I enlisted before I got drafted. He let out that, the part about the fight he'd had with his father. The awful things Ray had said to him, his mother in tears. Big John nodded. Me? I never finished eighth grade. He spoke quietly, just above a whisper, so they could hear any Japanese soldiers approaching. I was already big enough to work in and join a street gang. And that's what I did until I borrowed a, a car for a joyride and the cops got wise. The judge gave me a choice. Join the Marines or go to juvie. Enlisting sounded a lot better than reform school, and here I am. Ray couldn't believe Big John hadn't even finished eighth grade. And then he'd been arrested for stealing a car. How many more of Easy Company had crazy stories about how they ended up in Marines? Something rustled in the undergrowth just beyond the camp's perimeter, and the Big John put a, a hand to tell Ray to be quiet. Ray raised his rifle and squinted in the half-light of the moon. How'd you make out, Joe? asked a quiet voice. The words were English, but the accent was definitely Japanese. Ray, before Ray knew what was happening, Big John opened up with his big browning automatic. Ray didn't know what Big John was shooting at until a Japanese soldier popped up right in front of them. Banzai! The soldier screamed, charging Ray and Big John. Ray flinched but pulled his trigger, and the bullet hit the soldier. He fell to the ground, but he wasn't dead yet. With the strength he still had left, the Japanese soldier raised his rifle in the direction of Big John. In a wild panic, Ray pointed his rifle straight down at the enemy and shot him again. And at last, the man was still. Ray stood over the soldier, watching the life in his eyes go out. More Marines from Easy Company came running with the rifles. It was all over as quickly as it began. As his adrenaline wore off, Ray started to shake so much he couldn't stand. He staggered back, dropped his rifle, and collapsed inside the foxhole. He couldn't stop the, the tears that streamed from his eyes, and he turned away, sure Big John was going to make fun of him. Hey, it's okay, Ray, Big John said softly. He knelt beside Ray and put a hand on his shoulder. I know what it feels like to kill a man for the first time, Big John told him. We all do. That just made Ray cry harder, but it felt good to cry, to get it all out, all the sadness and terror and shaking rage he felt about everything he'd seen and done in just a day on Okinawa. You had to do it, Big John told him. You saved us both. Ray nodded, running his sleeve across his nose and wiping the tears from his eyes. It gets easier, Big John said. Ray couldn't tell if he meant it as a good thing or a bad thing. Big John stood. Get your rifle and see if he's got anything on him. Ray wiped his nose and dried his eyes again, and he stood. Looking at the body of the man he'd killed was easier if he didn't look at the face. Ray collected the soldier's rifle and laid it to his side. Then he went through the man's pockets. In one of them, he found a wallet, and inside the wallet was a picture of the soldier and his family. Ray was taken aback for a moment. Here was the face of the man he just killed, standing with a woman and a boy, probably his wife and young son. They all looked serious, the way people often did in old American photos. But the man had his hands on the soldiers of his, shoulders of his wife and son. He loved them, wanting to keep them safe, wanted to protect them from American devils like Ray. Ray took the picture out of the wallet and put it in his pocket. Ray would keep the photo, carry it with him, keep this man and his family alive in a way. It felt like the right thing to do. So we will stop there. I'll keep on reading tomorrow, same time, 12 o'clock. Uh, we'll post these up on our YouTube channel as well. So students keep working hard, keep doing the best that you can. Uh, take care of each other, and most importantly, stay safe. And remember, range is the way.